the range of engines in Russian cars is quite diverse. On the one hand, very simple and strong 1.6 MPI engines, 8-valve BSE, and related ones. On the other hand, there are a lot of cars with 1.8 TSI of different series and a significant amount of 1.4 TSI. Everything else is much less common. All pre-styling 1.4 MPI, 1.6 FSI, and 2.0 FSI, restyled 1.2 TSI, as well as diesels and forced 2.0 TSI come across, but rarely. The fate of cars with direct injection and supercharging was unenviable. Octavia remained a mass and fairly affordable car, the service culture of which was rather low. The owners often found out what kind of animal they got into their hands when the oil consumption suddenly grew to a liter per thousand and difficulties with starting began. From that era, the myths that a turbo engine must eat oil on the one hand and frenzied turbophobia on the other. The clear leader in simplicity and reliability is the 1.6 MPI engine. Fortunately, this is the old EA113 line in the most conservative version with an 8-valve cylinder head and conventional injection. The block is aluminum with cast iron liners. The timing drive is by a belt. The oil pump drive is by a chain. The most common option is BSE without EGR and with variable intake. There are also BGU. BSF and CCSA variants with a modernized cylinder head, a lightweight piston, and a reconfigured intake, but this engine is still very simple and compact. Repairing these engines is relatively inexpensive. For the worst case scenario, there are even repair sizes of pistons. The timing belt drive can potentially last 150,000, but it is still advisable to change the belt every 60. Among the disadvantages are a moderate tendency to coking of the oil scraper rings and leakage of the intake due to the characteristics of the intake manifold, as well as cracks in the exhaust manifold. You can also note not very successful ignition coils and oil leaks from oil seals and gaskets, as well as crankcase ventilation. An indirect drawback is a modest return. 102 forces is very little for a rather heavy car, so the engine needs to be turned for active movement in the city. In combination with the inherent poor mobility of the piston rings, this gives significant piston wear at runs over 250. However, with careful operation, these motors can run up to 500 plus before overhaul, and with an oil appetite, many drive for years, as long as there is compression. In addition to 1.6 MPI motors of the EA113 line on Octavia, there are three more options. You won't be able to find the extremely rare 8-valve 2.0 MPI, which is a pity the motor is structurally similar to the 1.6, but it's better simply because it has more traction. Motors 2.0 FSI 150 horsepower BLR backslash BVZ backslash BLY also belong to this line. But they have a 16-valve cylinder head with an expensive timing chain drive and a phase regulator, as well as direct injection. The maintenance of such a motor is much more expensive, especially in old age. There are no repair sizes, plus it has obvious difficulties with a cold start, especially in severe frosts over 20. Rear motor 2.0 TSI 200 horsepower BWA, set on RS, also belongs to the EA113 series, but the differences are quite serious. The cylinder head is also 16 valve and the timing drive is also chained like on the 2.0 FSI, but the cylinder block is cast iron, not aluminum. As you might guess from the power and TSI abbreviation, there is a turbocharger here. There are no repair dimensions, but the block, if anything, is perfectly sleeved at face value. With a cold start, things are much better for him, although the injection is direct, the control system for it is completely different, more successful. BWA is very fond of tuners, its boost potential is even higher than that of later 2.0 TSI EA888 engines. Motors 1.4 TSI 122 horsepower, this is a completely different EA111 series. Cast iron block, 16 valve cylinder head, timing chain, turbocharged, direct injection. Moreover, the engine air intercooler is liquid on 1.8, 2.0 and diesel engines air and the heat exchanger is built into the intake manifold. 
About 10 years ago, this engine could be called problematic. Very often there were troubles with the timing chain resource, more precisely, with a chain slip due to an unsuccessful tensioner and front cover. In combination with complex fuel equipment and a tendency to detonate due to an increase in intake temperature, and at the same time a rather weak piston group, they made the 1.4 TSI resource unpredictable. In addition, it warmed up in the winter for a long time, and only the DSG DQ200 box was paired with it. In urban conditions, it was possible to drive only 30 to 40,000 to the oil burner and repair, or face a failure due to the timing, but it was possible to drive several hundred thousand. The shortcomings of the motors were eliminated for a very long time. In fact, the engines of this line were brought to mind only by the appearance of the next generation Octavia. Its 122 horsepower version became omnivorous, no longer requiring 98th gasoline in everyday operation. Timing issues were resolved by changing all the problematic elements. Then the prices for all frequently changed components fell, and now the Caxa series motors do not look so bad against the general background especially those that were released after 2011 or have undergone high-quality repairs. The resource of the piston group is steadily more than 300,000. They are now inexpensive to repair. They are not very prone to oil appetite. The design is simple. Of the shortcomings, only a long warm-up and an unsuccessful hot part of the turbine remained. In general, read about the problems of the EA-111 line motors in a separate article and do not forget that almost all of the problems listed are now being treated. Also from the EA-111 line, Octavia comes across 1.6 FSI BLF series, and in theory, cars with a 1.2 TSI engine with a CBZB engine are possible, but these are rarely found on sale. In fact, there are no serious differences in operation from the 1.4 TSI. The engines are even a little simpler. One is naturally aspirated, the other with a simple 8-valve cylinder head. There are significantly more problems with engines of the EA888 line on Octavia than with small TSIs. To understand, it is better to read two articles about these engines separately about the oil burner and about everything else. It is interesting at the same time that the BYJ backslash BZB 160 horsepower motors that appeared in 2008. The EA888 Gen 1 lines were not seen in the oil burner. More precisely, it appeared when the valve of the crankcase ventilation system, VKG, failed and when the turbine died, but due to the piston group only when it was worn out and with runs of 250 plus, rarely earlier. Another thing is that they were not problem free with a very weak timing with an extremely unsuccessful slipping tensioner and a short-lived chain, they usually traveled less than 120,000 kilometers before replacement, while the replacement cost is several times higher than that of 1.4 engines. Moreover, the lubrication system for the entire line is not particularly successful, and the use of raw oil supply to the balancer shaft liners and the installation of mini-mesh filters in them was a frankly bad decision. Shafts wedged and broke the timing. Desperately flowed pumps failed debugged fuel equipment. In short, these are rather troublesome motors and primarily due to the dampness of the design. When installing timing and VKG components from the second generation and improvements, these motors still serve today. But on most of the Octavia A5, the EA888 motors are completely different. The EA888 Gen 2 line theoretically improved but in practice even more problematic. The second generation EA888 in the face of motors of the CDAB and CDAA 152 horsepower series appeared at the end of 2009. With Gen 1, the motors have a common basic design, but few common parts. There is a lightweight block and lightweight pistons, other VKG, timing, control system, and exhaust manifold. The improvements clearly did not benefit. The oil burner in such engines often appeared during the warranty period. You can read about attempts to replace pistons in the article at the link above. In the context of purchasing a second generation Octavia, we are interested in a practical point, the condition of these engines today. Yes, engines can be modified and deprived of the oil appetite. But such modernized variants are by no means the majority in the population. 
Frankly unsuccessful engines were made right up to 2011 and before the appearance of the block with number 221245, they needed a new piston group without any options. In theory, there are refinement technologies, but this is all cheap collective farming. Additionally, it is worthwhile to preventively change the timing belt tensioner. But there will still be problems with low oil pressure and, as a result, wear of the front camshaft support and breakage of the balancers. As with the EA111, the price of components and repairs is gradually decreasing, but other things being equal, the maintenance of 1.8 TSI will be more expensive than 1.4 TSI. And of course, the motor must be diagnosed very carefully. There are few diesel engines, but it makes sense to say a short line about them. They are quite strong both pre-styling EA188 with pump nozzles and post-styling EA189 with common rail. Against the general background, the early 16-valve 2.0 engines of the 188th AZV, BMM and BMN series stand out this is not very successful, prone to cracking the cylinder head. Common rail engines have piezoelectric injectors, relatively expensive, but still cheaper than pump injectors. There are other common problems with the intake manifold flaps, but they are usually already solved. The main problems of diesel engines on Octavia are usually not at all constructive, it's just difficult to find cars with mileage up to 200 to 300,000, they are almost all imported from Europe, and they usually take them in order to drive a lot. The brakes on the Octavia are simple and quite effective. ABS is in the database, ESP is not always, especially before restyling. And if you forget about the history of brake release in corners and bumps, a well-known problem of all Volkswagen like Mid-Zero, everything works fine. The front calipers are single cylinder with a floating caliper, with minimal maintenance they serve reliably for 10 years. Most cars don't have problems with brakes yet. Drives rarely leads, mainly in case of a clear violation of all the rules for operating the machine or a malfunction of the caliper. Yes, discs. Here even the original pads are surprisingly wear resistant, there are examples of their mileage for 100,000. The rear brakes are no worse than the souring of the handbrake mechanism, the screw drive and the aluminum caliper do their dirty work, do not stand out. The resource of pads is smaller, corroded attachment points of mud shields are more common, but in general everything is very reliable. ABS failures due to sensors happen, but are more often associated with connector problems than with the failure of the sensors themselves. Its design is typical for machines on the PQ35 platform, McPherson strut and multi-link. With a package for bad roads, that is, with increased ground clearance and additional anthers, the suspension quietly lives up to 120 to 150,000 kilometers without serious interventions. The front control arms are almost always steel, and the ball joint is replaceable. Even cars from Europe, station wagons, Lauren and Clement and Scout, for the Russian market have steel levers only a rare gray import comes across with aluminum ones. The rear multi-link is quite simple, again with replaceable silent blocks of levers. The most expensive suspension components are active dampers, which are rare. Of course, if you drive a lot on primers with a full load, then the resource of the rear elements will be significantly lower. For the sake of extending life in such cases, stiffer springs and even silence from the Audi RS3 are used. After 140 to 150,000 mileage, the owner will almost certainly have a big repair with the replacement of ball and thrust bearings in front and almost all the rubber bands in the rear suspension. The electric rail on the Octavia is the second generation ZF, like on the Passat B6. It is not set up in the best way, but now this is not a problem. For those who want to get a more intelligible steering and a heavy steering wheel, there are firmware from, again, an Audi RS3 or, say, a Golf R. The disadvantages of the second generation of rails are known. Sour crackers, which were not lubricated at the factory, begin to knock over time, poor sealing of both the rack housing and electronics. Sometimes, breakdown of the torque sensor on the shaft due to a broken cable. It is better to renew the lubricant in the rail in advance, but in which case all breakdowns are repaired relatively inexpensively. 
If you manage to stagger the rail really hard, the second-hand options are inexpensive, but in this case it is better to install a third-generation rail, for example, from the Golf 6-7 or from the Audi Q3. Services have learned to fix the mismatch of one fastening on the subframe and the wiring connector easily, such as collective farming does not carry potential electrical problems, but there are more chances to find a part with low mileage, and its reliability is even higher. Almost all cars are front-wheel drive, and the mechanical part is simple and reliable. The splines do not rust, the internal CV joints last a long time, but the external ones can start tapping after 120, how lucky. But most owners have no problem with them up to 250 miles or more. Oddly enough, there are enough cars on the mechanics, and Octavia has a pretty decent choice of manual gearboxes. These are 5-speed gearboxes of the 0A4 and 0AF series for 1.4 and 1.6, as well as 6-speed 02Q, 02S, and 0AG with a dual-mass flywheel for 1.8, 2.0, and diesels. In general, there are more than two dozen varieties of boxes. The boxes themselves are strong enough, but the differentials are everywhere weak, not loving slippage, as well as dirty oil or its absence especially in combination with the first and second. The flywheel brings the sixth step. If it starts to play, then over time it breaks the bearings of the input shaft. The common misfortune of all types of manual gearboxes is the wear and tear of the switching mechanism and its whims. The wear of the tips of the cables and the slider of the mechanism leads to difficult gear shifting and increased backlash. There are only three types of automatic gearboxes for Octavia, a 6-speed Eisen 9G hydromechanical automatic transmission and two DSG preselective gearboxes of types DQ200 and DQ250. At one time, the Eisen assault rifle was considered an exemplary choice. After all, this is a classic, and a real machine must be reliable. In practice, this is not entirely true. The box is undoubtedly quite strong, very comfortable, and easy to use. But with reliability, everything is not so clear. The box is devoted to a separate large material, but it would not be superfluous to mention the main points. There are two problems with this box on Octavio with any of the motors. The first is frequent overheating. The used cooling scheme works more like a heating system, the automatic transmission heat exchanger has a thermostat on the engine side, and antifreeze goes into the box only if the engine has warmed up to 95 plus degrees, so the nominal temperature of the box is 100 to 115 degrees. As the heat exchanger becomes overgrown with deposits from the inside, and with a rare replacement of antifreeze it is literally 5 years, the temperature begins to rise further. Too hot oil quickly enough kills the entire box. You can slightly reduce the temperature by simply removing the thermostat in the pipe, which will allow the box to heat up less even without alterations to the cooling system. It is especially effective if the engine also has a cold thermostat at 85 to 90 degrees. And yet it is not a panacea. The heat exchanger is deadly, so it is worth monitoring the temperature in the box with a diagnostic scanner regularly, even if the thermostat is removed. And even better, install an external cooling radiator, since this large box is not needed. The second problem is the oil change schedule and the sensitivity of Eisen valve bodies to the presence of wear products in it. Officials are in no hurry to change the oil even at 60,000 mileage, and to save the resource of the valve body, you need to do this even more often. Owners, as always, save. As a result of a combination of two factors, for most cars, the box kicks by mileage of 120 to 150,000. The reason, as a rule, is that the pistons are torn, they are overheated and have lost their elasticity, and the body of the valve body plate is worn out, there are leaks in the valves, and, possibly, the hydraulic plate is clogged. If you continue to ride with kicks, then a strong mechanical part breaks down. What to do if the AKP has already been brought to a dying state? Do not rush to change to a robot, this is fraught with compatibility problems. You can consider installing a 6 mortar from a fresh polo slash rapid, they get up with minimal modifications. You can try to fix it, but repairs can be expensive, because in the tradition of boxed services, you change everything in a row by typing. 
but even if you come across adequate craftsmen, the repair is objectively expensive due to the complexity, at least this applies to work on the valve body. DSG boxes became a horror story for owners by about a year by the 12th, and with a fair delay, by this time, the reliability of the units was already growing with might and main, but the popular rumor could not be stopped. Now the main horrors of the box have already disappeared. So, a new clutch unit costs literally 200 euros, a mechatronic for an exchange will cost about the same amount, and maybe even cheaper. There are solutions for repairing pumps, mechatronic housings, hydraulic accumulators, gear forks, and even clutch restoration. In fact, the 7-speed Dry DQ200 is now one of the most cost-effective machines in terms of operating costs. You should read more about these boxes in the material, where typical breakdowns and how to fix them are analyzed in detail. The problem with the DQ200 specifically on Octavia is that this box was installed not only with 1.4 TSI, but also with 1.8 TSI. The latter were too momentary for a robot, especially if the owner was fond of chip tuning. In fact, the 7-speed DSG cannot withstand more than 250 newton meters without modifications. For some time, cars of 2008 to 2009 with DQ201.8 TSI were famous for being the most problematic Octavias, and the price for them was even lower than for the 1.6 version with mechanics. Now, due to the fact that DSG-7 repair has become much more affordable, the skew is not so noticeable or has disappeared altogether. In general, there is nothing to be afraid of, although it would be nice to clarify from the service book which plugs are on a particular box and which version of the mechatronics. There are also cars on forks with balls and miraculously surviving old-style mechatronics. Well, it is imperative to conduct comprehensive computer diagnostics in a specialized service since the DQ200 is diagnosed perfectly. DSG-6 DQ250 wet clutch boxes on the Octavia are rare, they were only stock on the RS, although some of them appeared thanks to swaps. We talked about this type in detail in the article about the Volkswagen Tiguan. There were few cars with all-wheel drive, they were quite expensive and were brought from Europe. And the all-wheel drive with the Haldux 4 clutch is not bad, only the oil needs to be changed on time and the wiring needs to be monitored. The body is partially galvanized, and the internal cavities are treated with hot wax, but it is let down by the poor quality of the color. Peeling small chips and swelling of paint on the bodies are the rule rather than the exception. They are literally everywhere, on the leading edge of the hood, on the doors below the decorative molding and near the handle, on the top of the threshold, in the doorways, on the tailgate, on the leading edge of the roof, and, of course, on the arches. Depending on the year of manufacture, the style of operation, and the approach of the owner, these troubles can be invisible, almost invisible, or turn into huge rusty spots and swollen rusty seams and door rolling. But they will be with a probability close to 100%, you just need to look. Only garage stored cars with minimal mileage, double factory paint, and cars with timely ceramics are spared from chipping. Or simply repainted for some reason. And yes, cars with non-metallic paint have a slightly thinner paint layer, and the risk of damage to the paintwork is higher. The reasons are not only in the too gentle layer of paintwork. In some elements, chips occur simply because of their shape, for example, on the edges of doors with a reverse bend and on the outside of the wheel arches. In some places, the body design is unsuccessful as a whole. So, abrasions of the front fender at the junction with the headlight are almost inevitable. The rubber seal wipes the paintwork to holes, but no films were provided. Below is a shelf for attaching the bumper to the wing and the wing to the front panel, where moisture also stagnates. Headlights and front panel have to be removed quite often, and almost any serious work on the motor, unless it is an 8-valve 1.6. Therefore, the gap in any case will not be very accurately set, and the attachment points may have damage to the paintwork. The door openings in the lower part are rubbed by the seal, it is a bit harsh, and if the threshold is dirty, it easily scratches the paintwork. Especially if the door sagged. There is a similar problem at the rear door here that Hofmeister bend rubs the paint in the protrusion of the rear pillar. 
As you can see, the factory spared the overlays and films, it is pasted only on dealer cars and on a very small section of the rear door and threshold. On cars after restyling, there is a factory plastic door sill, but it does not protect the edge of the metal, but dust collects under it, and the metal rusts there even better than just open. On the rear wings, corrosion creeps up from the bumper attachment points into the gap and seam of the wing, and there is just a sharp stamping, and the zinc layer is thinned, and the metal is stressed. The back edge of the arch is especially affected, it picks up the paint there first. For cars before restyling, there is a characteristic chipping place on the hood, just opposite the junction of the upper edge of the headlight and the wing. Here the bending load on the beak is maximum and the edge of the seal rubs the metal. As a result, a rust stain grows from the inner edge of the hood panel. After restyling, a modified seal reduced the chances of problems in this area. License plate lights during installation damaged the paintwork of the tailgate, and corrosion at their fasteners is the rule rather than the exception. Felt lockers front and back allow you to save on soundproofing, but with age they begin to accumulate moisture, contributing to the formation of rust inside. The most unpleasant thing awaits the potential owner of the Octavia A5 when viewed from below and during partial disassembly with the removal of bumpers, lockers, skins, etc. Even for low mileage cars that look almost ideal, everything can be very neglected from below. First of all, check how tightly the factory anti-gravel layer sits on the thresholds, especially where there are sandblast marks from the front wheels. The coating lags behind the metal, but does not fly around, forming a cavity with water, which gradually destroys the galvanized layer and the metal itself. Moreover, the anti-gravity layer itself is quite hard. Just by pressing a finger, it is not always possible to identify a problematic place. You will have to search by sound, checking by pressing with a hard object. And the source of the problem, from which it all started, can be located at a distance of tens of centimeters from the main focus of underfilm corrosion, for example, on the lower or side edge of the threshold or on the upper shelf, being connected with it by the thinnest leg of swollen paint. Part of the sill is hidden by the front fender, where there are a couple of mounting holes through which dirt and water enter the sill from a pocket behind the front arch. And from them, underfilm corrosion also spreads, reaching the zone covered with anti-gravity. At the same time, the lower fastening of the front fender at the junction with the threshold is intensively rusting. The plastic door sill on cars after restyling is not intended at all to prevent damage to it by the sealant its edge is scratched in the same way. It accumulates moisture and hides pockets of rust for some time. In the wheel arches, the situation is no better. In front, the area not covered by the locker strongly rots. Over time, numerous point foci merge here into a layer of solid rust. Particularly affected are the holes with seals through which the brake pipes and wiring are brought out, as well as the bracket for attaching the brake hose behind the suspension strut and the pocket above the front of the threshold. The inner edge of the arch also readily rusts, at least on cars from Moscow and St. Petersburg, especially if the felt locker is wet and swollen. In the rear arches, the vertical seam in the front of the arch and the spar below the joint with the inner arch sometimes suffer. Fortunately, the seam itself is covered with a thick layer of sealant. The arch area behind the shock absorber and its mounting bracket is covered with ulcers. Well, in the right arch, rust also climbs behind the fuel filler pipes. You can look for pockets of corrosion around the spare wheel well and at the rear suspension trailing arm mounting bracket. A welded rear subframe that is rusty is quite a typical picture, as are the rusty transverse side members of the body above it, anti-gravel coating and sealant were spared on their seams. What's nice is that the bottom itself under the passenger compartment and the seams of the engine compartment trunk and body pillar are usually intact there is minimal rust on interior floors and is usually associated with heater leaks and spills this car needs to be most carefully examined from below from above everything is treated simply and easily thanks to the galvanized layer and the abundance of body parts but felt lockers and not very high quality study of the protection of thresholds and the rear of the body can backfire much more expensively Peeling emblems and chrome, something to be expected. Worn soft windshield from Benson 2, although for 10 years it retains its presentation. 
the headlights on all cars are overridden even faster, requiring polishing and coating, and on cars after restyling, the lenses are also prone to fading, there is no DRL here. At the same time, the headlights are prone to condensation, and the lower headlight mount on cars after restyling is unsuccessful, the adjusting screw breaks. Fortunately, there is a repair kit for this problem, and instead of a plastic stud, you can put a steel one. Everything is repaired traditionally, polishing, film, Chinese lenses inside, removable glass, on butyl sealant, and an extra hole in the headlight housing. Bad owners just take off the lid. The hood opening cable has a so-called Bowden clutch, a place for splicing cables. And it breaks, after which the hood can be opened only after long dances with tambourines, so it's better to pull it off in advance with a plastic clamp or fasten it tightly with wire. Fog lights are gentle, do not like puddles and frequent switching on, but this is quite typical. But the problems with mirrors are more serious than you might expect. Aluminum brackets corrode there, which is why characteristic smudges form on the doors and the folding mechanism turns sour. The situation is similar for the basics of door handles, here the aluminum bracket is destroyed in the same way, leaving dirty marks and damaging the paintwork. But the most unpleasant thing here is inside the door, not outside. To get to the window mechanism and the lock, you will have to remove the tightly glued and riveted shield of the door mechanisms. On the Passat B5, an almost similar solution was applied, except that the shield was bolted. On the Octavia, the rivets will have to be drilled out. True, this is not necessary to replace broken glass. You can simply remove the fragments through the speaker hole. It is also riveted, but not glued, and insert and remove the glass from above. Many owners complain about sound deadening, but the problem is often the poor performance of the door seals. The rear window in the doors has an adjustable gap. Over time, the seal sits down, and it needs to be adjusted again. This is a typical problem that manifested itself after 60,000 mileage. Here it is enough to remove the door trim, and you can get close to the adjustment bolt with a screwdriver. Those who do not delve into the design features of the machine, in an attempt to remove the excess gap, often fill the sealant with plumbing sealant. The front doors will have to be adjusted entirely, because the driver's front door sags noticeably at mileages of 150 plus, requiring the use of adjusting plates, replacement of hinges, or tricks with turning the spacer or bending it. And if the car has been driven for a long time with a sagging door, then both the lock bracket and the seal will require replacement. Be sure to check if the microswitch works to open the door. Often, in order not to climb into the lock, not to remove the internal shield of the mechanisms, they put an external opening sensor, since the shape of the door trim allows it to be inserted without touching the metal, and the wiring to the lock is located on the inside of the shield, it is very easy to connect to the yellow-brown wire to the switch easily. The windows on the Octavia are cable operated, and the cable sometimes breaks. In the front doors, when the glass is jammed, it simply warps with a crunch, and therefore the breakdown of the window regulator gearbox is much less common. An excellent interior at one time became the main competitive advantage of Octavia. Firstly, it is simply very spacious, the car had no competitors in its class, even many cars of the formerly higher D-class of those years were less spacious inside. The quality of the finish is very good, and the ergonomics are excellent, all Volkswagen. In addition, the car looks sleek, like a sedan, but there is a full tailgate in the back, so you can use the entire interior volume for cargo. There are plenty of cons too. Soundproofing and unimportant seals were mentioned above. At the same time, the inner door handles creak, and sometimes the rear door lock knocks. The hatch makes a lot of noise and leaks, but this is a rare option, found only on imported cars. The ceiling does not like even slight moisture, it easily peels off after dry cleaning or if the car has been exposed to rain with open windows. The sills and the rag covering of door cards are rubbed off, and on cars in rich trim levels, the soft touch cover of the buttons peels off, there is no cover on the budget ones, and the resource is higher. The trunk lining is bristling on the left for everyone. These are not the consequences of an accident, but simply a design flaw. Well, everyone breaks the ashtray, it's just flimsy, and mileage and attitude have nothing to do with it. 
The light switch wiping white is just a sign of all the Volkswagen like ones, where the driver constantly turns the low beam on and off and does not drive with it all the time. The resource of the steering wheel and seats is very decent. The plastic steering wheel during normal use is eternal, with runs over 200 it differs little from the new one. The fabric seats are also very wear resistant, except that the threads and the seams are a little shaggy. The mileage of such cars is easy and relaxed, especially in simple versions with a manual transmission and without ESP. A leather steering wheel, and even with buttons, is less wear resistant, but with careful use, without scratching with nails and rings, the texture retains up to 100,000, and a normal appearance up to 200. Leather and combined seats are made of very mediocre quality leatherette. Even in the Lauren and Clement trim levels, where seemingly good leather is used, the back side of the skin is still made of leatherette, and the front side is made of the original Alcantara. Leatherette is not very reliable everywhere, in the absence of special care, by the age of 5 to 6, creases and cracks become clearly visible and require alteration or masking with liquid leather. In hot regions, problems appeared even during the warranty period, and under heavy drivers, in addition to damage to the upholstery, the seams and the side of the seat suffer greatly. The resource of the interior fan is very small, especially if the climate is manual and there is no need for an external pre-filter. The plastic of the stove pipes ages very quickly and they become brittle. The problem is regular overheating of motors and not very successful antifreeze. Leaks due to broken tubes happen surprisingly often. Check them from the side of the engine compartment for collective farm repairs. The air conditioner here is quite hardy. On cars with 1.6 engines with runs up to 200, the air conditioner clutch bearing may make noise, but otherwise everything is assembled well and does not cause much trouble. Corrosion and pipe cracks are rare, more often after an accident and serious work on the engine compartment. For all the general simplicity of the design of the machine, the electrics of the PQ35-46 platform are very sophisticated, with many blocks and huge possibilities. It is a pity that the quality of the wiring is not too high. Like many other cars, typical breakdown points are wiring in the corrugations of doors and trunk, but there are also breakdowns of the cabin harness, moreover, in its upper part, under the instrument panel, and in the engine compartment, after entering the fuse box in the engine compartment and just wiring on the engine. The system has rich diagnostic capabilities, having a scanner and simple diagnostic software is a must, but they will not help you find the problem if there is no power on one of the main units or there is a short circuit in the data bus. Let's add here the increasingly manifest trouble with corrosion of block pads in the cabin, a high load on the generator and water in the engine compartment fuse box. In general, by the age of 10 plus, Octavia may already have quite expensive and intractable problems in this area. But there is also good news. Now the price of most electronic components is no longer too high. So, the BCM unit, also known as the comfort unit, which is very sensitive to short circuits and other troubles, has learned to rebind and repair. Yes, and it is located not on the floor, as in previous generations of various VW models, Passat B5, Touareg I, Skoda Superb I and others, but under the front panel of the cabin, which reduces the risk of flooding. The remaining less vulnerable blocks are also well studied and mastered. There are no problems at all with key binding for cars before styling. There are no special difficulties with recoding tidy, replacing blocks and their firmware either. Extensive customization options and too easy access to system settings entails the risks of unsuccessful coding, unsuccessful firmware and simply crookedly written non-factory software. Let's add here the inevitable intervention of electricians to connect new units. In general, it is worth checking the correspondence between the actual and factory equipment, and it is better not to mess with the designers.